Well, have you ever had this thought to yourself, this thought of it's over? It's over. I'm done. There's no way I can recover from this. The circumstance, it's too overwhelming. The situation, it's too painful. I can't do this anymore. I, it's over. I can't live any longer. I can't move forward any longer. Maybe for you or for me, it was a self-inflicted situation. Isn't it interesting how God creates humans and then he just gives us free will? He's like, go do whatever you want. And so many of us shoot ourselves in the foot and we spend the rest of our life bleeding out. It's self-inflicted. God's got a great plan and we go outside of it and as a result, we walk through crazy situations. Maybe that's you here today. I've blown it too bad, I've gone too far. Maybe you made a risky investment over leveraged yourself, went bankrupt, and your family is currently reaping the consequences from that. Maybe in a weak moment, you went outside of your marriage, you really, that's not you, but you did in a weak moment, and now as a result, you're divorced, your kids are wet in the bed and they're angry and won't even speak to you. Maybe in a weak moment, you didn't just raise your your, your voice, but you raise your fist and you abuse someone that you love dearly. The unthinkable. You think about these, these situations and afterwards you're like, how on earth can I move forward? How can I continue to live? I might as well just take my life because I'm worthless. I can never be forgiven. I have a friend who made a choice to drink and drive and tragically take the life of two ladies, one who was pregnant. And I, and I think about how that could have been me. I made the decision to drink and drive many times as a, as a teenager. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. But, but this young man tragically takes the life of some innocent people. How do you move on? in your heart, is, is it over? Am I done? Maybe it's not a self-inflicted situation. Maybe it's a circumstance outside of your control. Maybe you just got dumped recently. I remember getting dumped as a ninth grader. Talking about, I thought it was over, man. That's my future wife. Dumped. Everybody say dumped. We've all been there, right? It's over, it's done. I can't keep on moving on. You could go on and on, cut bats at work. How about loss of a loved one? I, I have so many friends that have lost loved ones. One in particular, he's a fellow minister in our city and his wife came down with cancer and she beat it at first but then it came back and took her life prematurely and she's in heaven. And here's this single dad raising teenagers. I mean, how hard, I mean, I mean, where are my parents of teenagers right now? How, I mean, how hard is it with two, right? Like, think about that. And here's a guy that loves God. He's a minister. He's, he's doing his, yeah, he's not perfect, but man, this guy. Like, when I'm around him, I'm like, dude, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Just humble servant of God. What do you do? How do I move on? How do I do this? There's no way I can move forward. We find ourselves in these wild positions. If that's you, here today, and if it's not you, let me just say this. Put this in your back pocket because you will hit a time in your life where you will be right here, and you'll need this message. I came to bring good news. If, if that's where you're at right now, listen, we're gonna move from shame and guilt and regret, listen now, to peace, to purpose, and to power. Do you believe it? It can happen for you today. I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at people all across this room and, and you, I see it. I've seen what God's done in your life. There's proof in the pudding, baby. In my worst time on a bed of suicide, dealing drugs, God came into my car and radically changed my life. And I came to bring that good news here today. The resurrection proves it. There's hope. There's hope. Now, in the text, you'll see there's some hopeless people called the disciples. 
the followers of Christ. Jesus handpicked them, 12 knuckleheads, to follow him. Some dudes dropped their fisher nets and just were like, I'm gonna follow Jesus, he's the Messiah. At the time, Israel was under Roman rule. In their minds, they're thinking, I'm gonna follow this Jesus, I'm gonna give my life to him, and guess what? He's gonna conquer the Romans, we're gonna be the it, we're gonna be like, yeah, let's go. Until they didn't understand the big picture plan that Jesus actually had to come and die, not conquer the Romans through this rule, but through a crucifixion. And so just imagine, you're like, okay, I've given my life. I've, I've cashed in my 401k. I'm following Jesus. And now you see him on the cross brutally murdered. All the disciples are like, man, it's over. Someone say it's over. Wouldn't you feel the same way? Put yourself in the disciple's sandals. You'd be done. I'm done. And they were so scared, man. They, they saw what happened to the Messiah on the cross. They're like, dude, they're scared. They're huddled up. They're thinking it's over until Jesus rolled into the room, baby. And that's what you and I need. Look at, look at John chapter 20. And I want to just start in verse 19. I love that. So this is Easter the first Easter in the evening time, okay? <laughs> that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Isn't this so cool? Like, by the way, when we get our glorified bodies, we can do some wild stuff. We can be like, you know, beam me up Scotty and just show up to any place you want. Just walk. He didn't pick the lock. He just whoop, like went right, right through the door. How dope is that? And here's what he says. And if you're a note taker, the first of three, listen. He says, watch. Peace. Everybody just throw up the peace sign. Around. Peace be with you, he said. Peace. They go from anxiety Fear, overwhelmed, it's over. Jesus rolls into the room in the very first, and by the way, if I'm Jesus, I'd be like, yo, why did you guys like deny me and stuff? Like, what happened here? You left me in my, in my most time of need. You bailed on me. But you know what did, Jesus, what did Jesus say instead? He didn't say any of that at all. What did he say? Peace. I came to tell you, man, in your worst times where you think it's over, listen, you don't need a pill, you don't need a politician, you need his presence. The peace of God, he walks into the room, he delivers peace. He's not shaming you, blaming you, pointing his finger down at you, he's saying, peace, be still. The anxiousness, the anxiety, the chaos, it will flow out. And this is interesting, this is reality. I mentioned to you one of my good friends who's a minister in town, talk about the anxiety, the fear, being overwhelmed at times. He wrote out this email to some of the people that support him and his ministry. And I just wanna read a little bit to you from his note. He says, as some of you have probably heard me say, the grieving process has been so much more difficult, intense, and heavier than I ever imagined it could be. But I continue to remember personally and seek to encourage and share Jesus with others by truly saying, listen now, this is a guy that lost his wife to cancer. He's raising teenagers. Here's what he says, that without the hope of Jesus, I can't imagine surviving this. Come on, man. That's peace. That's peace. Jesus says, I know you guys think it's over. I know you're overwhelmed. You're, you're stuck behind locked doors. Maybe that's some of y'all in here. You're stuck. He says, man, I, I came to bring not condemnation. I came to bring peace. The very next verse is so solid in verse 20. And this is how we have peace. The peace of God, we first have to make peace with God. And how do we do it? Through the cross. Look what he says. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands from the cross and the side, you remember they, they pierced Jesus through his side while he was on the cross. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Let me just say this and be crystal clear. We can't have the peace of God until we make peace with God through the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't have to 
keep on trying to pay for your own sin, Jesus paid once and for all. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, verse five, he predicted that this Messiah wouldn't come to conquer the Romans with a Roman rule, this government type thing, that he was gonna come and the way he would lead these people back to him and give him peace is through the cross. Listen to what he says. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our what? For our what, church? Peace, our shalom was upon him. And by his stripes, the stripes that were on his back because they had this, this cat of nine tails that launched into his back and they would rip off ribbons of his flesh. The stripes on the back, that's how we have peace with God. It's not trying to earn it with our good works. It's because simply the cross of Jesus Christ. Is anybody excited about that? That is, that is truth from the word of God. I love it. Freaked out, scared. Jesus comes in peace. Not just peace, but number two, if you're a note taker, write it down this way, purpose. Purpose. Verse 21 now, he says, peace. Again, man, he's doubling down on peace. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent, has sent me, so I'm sending you. Again, put yourself in, in the disciples' shoes, man. You're, you're behind locked doors. You're fearful. You're thinking it's over. I've blown it too bad. Think of Peter, man. Peter denying Christ. I've blown it too bad. And Jesus comes in. He's like, no, I'm, I'm going to double down on peace, and then let me just give you your purpose. Guess, guess what? The Father sent me on a rescue mission. Now I'm going to send you. Someone say, send it. I love it. I think purpose. Don't you think about purpose sometimes? Like, how did I get here? Why am I here? And where am I going? You ever think of that to yourself? And we're trying to find purpose in all these other things, accumulating things, and, do, and nothing wrong with all that stuff. But you know, when we're re, you know what our number one purpose is? Is to be sent by Jesus to go reach the lost. What does Luke 19.10 say? You guys remember that one? The Son of Man, Jesus, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. I've found it in my life when I'm on mission and I take my mistakes and my misery and actually turn it into a missionary service. I connect with people. Some of the idiotic things that I've done, I've shared with the church. I made a choice to have an abortion when I was a junior in high school. And people, some people leave the church. You know why I do that? Because I want to be raw and real and I want to make my misery, my biggest regret something that I can build a bridge with and tell you, young man, young daughter of God, he's not through with you yet, it's not over. He can forgive you for anything that you've gone through. He can turn it into purpose. He flips the pain and he turns it into purpose. My friend who just turned 22 this week in jail, my friend that in, in a tough moment was drinking and driving and tragically took the lives of innocent people got sentenced to a few decades in prison. And one of our pastors in touch with him regularly, with the parents as well. By the way, he came to Christ as a result right here at Love Church. His parents did at Love Church, came to Christ saying, hey, you know what? No matter what you have done, Jesus can forgive you. And by the way, here's the report. This young man found his purpose in prison. There are people behind bars that need hope that only Christ can give and forgiveness that only he can give. And there's many right now that God's using him to connect with and he's translating his pain into purpose. He's sent behind bars. He's got a couple of decades to deal with. And you might think that you've done the unthinkable and it's over for you. Can I just tell you that is a lie from the pit of hell. He, he can change it for his good. He can leverage it. The Bible says, go make disciples of all nations, wherever you're at. You want to you wanna feel alive and have purpose? Let's move from constipated Christianity, Christianity, and we actually move forward, and we find the flow again, and we reach people right where they're at. Finally, number three, power. Oh, this is my favorite. It's so cool. Look at verse 22. 
<laughs> then he breathed on them and said, <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Some were like, I'm never coming back to this church ever again. <laughs> Next week, 9 and 11, come back. It'll be a little more chill. But <laughs> Think about this. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God takes the dirt, he was forming a man, Adam, and he did the same thing. <sighs> he breathed life into him. It's the same thing that Jesus did. He breathed <sighs> life into the disciples. And you might have come in here today, and this is how you feel. You feel dead. God wants to breathe power. That's the only way we can perform our purpose is with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing we conjure up. It's God. You know what Christianity is? It's trusting that his unconditional love flows through me and you and flows to all kinds of people. That's power that's, that's released. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It's, it's power that's being released. I'll close with this illustration. It's, it's interesting. I saw such a great picture of when you and I do something dumb or disconnected from God. Isn't it interesting, by the way, when we do something dumb, like we do the opposite of what we really should do. We go isolate instead of actually get around people. And some of us, let me just apologize for the church because some of y'all think that when you come back, we're gonna beat you up and be like, where you been, idiot? It's actually the exact opposite. No matter what you've done, Come back, man. There, there's something better that God wants to do in your life. I was out golfing with this guy, and we were on this golf cart. I know you can't picture me golfing. It's not pretty, but it's okay. I do my best. And we're on this course, and it says cart pass only. So you're driving this little cart, and if you go off the path at all, it goes, wait, it has, eh, eh, you know, it's like, eh, like go, eh, go back in reverse or whatever. And usually it gives you a chance to kind of back back up a little bit, but this time it just shut down. So me and my homie are like sitting there like, D -d what do we do? He gets, on the, he gets on the phone, he calls like the, what do you call it when you check in for golf? Clubhouse, Clubhouse pro shop, yeah. And the homie's like, oh man. He's like, he's like let, me, let me just, and he, he, made a, he made like, and like the power went back into the golf cart, and we went back on and kept on going. And we were like driving, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's your life and my life. We, we, we wanted to, God's like, cart path only, I'm telling you, it's gonna work better this way. Cart path only, cart path only. And we're like, yeah, whatever, you know, I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> Until we made the call to the clubhouse, that's when it actually came back down, the power, and now we move forward. And let me just say, I looked at my friend, and he's like a male model, good-looking dude, and he, uh, he made some really poor choices, went through a divorce, chaotic stuff, and let me just say, he was stuck in shame, regret. He, he was, he, it was a perfect, same thing with me, stuck in shame. I knew what was right. My mom raised me the right way, but I'm like, no, I'm stuck with shame. But it wasn't until we surrendered, we came back, God filled us with power and set us on a whole new trajectory. Can I just tell you, that's for you. This young man got remarried and come, <laughs> it's so cool, they're expecting their first child together next month. It's not over. I'll land with this. I just said that, didn't I? All right, I'll say it again. Just land with this. I promise you this time. I know you have Easter plans, but tune in with me these last couple minutes because this is really important. This message, it's gonna go one of two ways, speaking of path, specifically for those that have blown it really bad. And as I was studying, there were two disciples that I was looking at in particular. One was, this guy, his name was Judas. And Judas was one of Jesus' disciples who betrayed him with a kiss, turned him into the officials who ended up killing them, killing Jesus. And he found out about it, and he was so overwhelmed with regret that he went and hung himself 
took his own life because he said, man, it's over. And the Bible says he like fell and like it's, cra- it's wild, his guts came out. It's just a horrible ending. But can I, just, can I just tell you, I don't think it needed to end that way. Even Judas could have been forgiven. I believe he was forgiven and he took his life prematurely. I think we can either go that way and maybe you don't take your life, but you live the rest of your life stuck in regret like Judas. Or, <laughs> I got better news. There's another path for some of you, some of us. Peter, you have the betrayer in Judas, but you got the denier in Peter. And in the very next chapter, this is your homework for Easter, Easter Sunday homework. Don't you love that? Read John chapter 21, and Jesus comes back to Peter. He restores him. He forgives them. And guess what? Now, Peter goes in Pentecost. He preaches a message. 3,000 souls get saved. Bam. You have Judas. Listen, this is your, your response as a human. Check this out. You got, you got free will. You can just stay condemned, overwhelmed, and, and just and lead like, like Judas. It's wild. The field, they called it the field of blood that Judas took his own life. You could have the field of blood or you could have the fields of blessing and believers coming to Christ through your mistake. It's that simple. I'm praying that it's the latter, amen? Thank you, God, for this Easter celebration. What a, what a divine word for those who have thought it's over. And I pray against any lie of the enemy, no matter what any of us have done in here, I pray that we would believe, be restored to our creator through the cross of Jesus Christ. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. You proved it by raising Jesus from the dead, and now we pray you would do the impossible once again. Over 2,000 years later, you're still resurrecting souls, resurrecting bodies, and I pray you would do it. Pray you would heal the brokenhearted, repair marriages, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name. Before I